Uh, just to begin with, you were certainly there at the, at the very beginnings of, of rock and roll. Did you have any inkling at the time that uh, this was a type of music that was going to live on through the decades as it has? Well, uh, not really. I thought country, you know, we we started out doing country music, mm -hmm. hillbilly music, and then we, you know, and just faster versions of it and so I, maybe I thought, uh, I knew it felt good, but uh, no, I didn't think it would last, no. <laughs> like it has, thank goodness. Yeah. Did, did you have a plan or a recipe for the type of music that you, that you wanted to make when, when you were starting out? When we started out, we had um, two guitars and a bass fiddle, upright bass, double bass. And... Uh, didn't even have electric guitar, but uh, that's why I said we did mostly country, and uh, of course Elvis came along in '55 and kind of revolutionized the the sound. So, but I had electric guitar before then. I bought my first electric guitar uh, before. I, well, when I went to Germany, actually in '51. Uh huh. And I bought a German guitar there. It really, I really like it. Was a Framus. Really liked it, and they shipped it home for me. The army did when I got out in '53. But the neck bowed on the thing. It was really good. I played with a little band over there in uh, Germany at, at Frankfurt. Every we played every Saturday night at the Usurar Grand Ole Opry. It was eight bands on that thing. We had a lot of fun doing that. I I got in with some guys from Texas, a bunch of cooks from the 2nd Armored Division. And uh, really had it made while I was over there. So, But then when I got home, I had enough money saved up. I bought me a brand-new 1952 Telecaster Fender uh -huh. for a hundred and a quarter. Uh-huh. Do you um do you remember the first time you heard the term rockabilly being used to describe your music? Well, uh, I liked uh, Hank Williams. Of course, did a lot of stuff that was like uh, Buckets Got a Hold In and stuff like that. It was uh, really good. And then they had the old Pipeliner Blues. Everybody did that back then. Uh, but Elvis was the first one that really changed the sound for the rest of us. Got to give him credit for that. He was he was the forerunner of everything. He and Scotty Moore, actually, without uh, Scotty and Bill Black, I don't think uh, he would have created the sound he did. But with those two guys, they created a new sound, really. Yeah. And it, if you had to write down a, a dictionary definition of rockabilly, how would you describe it? Rockabilly. I call it uh, fast country. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's really what, you know, you just speed it everything up and plus you added drums. Yeah. So that that was about it really for rockabilly for me. Now, later on, when that all the, the horns and all that stuff came along, that turned it into more into rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. Do you um, do you remember the first time you met Sam Phillips? Nineteen fifty-five, and uh, December fifty-five, we went over there to see him. Me and Kern Kennedy, who's still playing with me, piano player for the Pacers. And uh, John Ray Hubbard, our bass player, he's dead now. And uh, we went over to see Sam. We'd, we'd open for Elvis four different times here in Jackson County in 55. And Elvis thought we ought to go see Sam so we'd get on that little Sun record where everybody wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So we went over and talked to him. He said, well, go home. And said, you guys are pretty good. said, go home and work something up, work a couple of songs up, maybe add something else to it or something. So 
So we come back home, and that's when we added Jack Nance and Joe Lewis to the band. And with Jack, we wanted a... Jack was a guy that played trumpet for us. Jack, he was a music major. And he could play uh, about anything. Any instrument he picked up, he could play. He was a taught music. Anyway, he uh, said, I don't have a saxophone. And that's what we really wanted was saxophone. But I said, I don't have a saxophone, but I got a trumpet. I said, well, that'll work. I said, man, in clubs, that'll be good. That'll be loud. Because our PA systems weren't the best in the world back then. You know, we had a little 25-watt amp and two speakers. Mm. So, uh, and it turned out the best thing that ever happened to us when we added the trumpet. Changed our sound from everybody else's. Went back anyway in January and recorded for Sam. And uh, man said the rest is history. Yeah. How how would you describe uh, Sam Phillips as a man to work with? Well, he was good to work with. All he did was uh, he'd sit up there and he'd uh, say, let's hear what you got. He'd turn that machine on. He'd go through and he said, well, he said, let's try that again. He never would say, you know, tell you anything really definite to do. He'd, and I think he worked more on feeling. Mm-hmm is what you're missing in today's music. There's no... They try and put the feeling in it, but it just isn't there like Sam got it. Everything that Sam put out had feeling to it. And I think that primarily that's uh, what made him so successful in the music business. Uh, as you mentioned, you opened shows for Elvis and also the, the likes of Jerry Lee Lewis. Any, any standout memories there of, of uh, opening shows for, for, for those people? Well, Jerry Lee came on about uh, right after we went to Sun and got on Sun. Bob Neal was managing us or booking us some. He and uh, Sam had this uh, Stars Incorporated, which booked the Sun artists, so they put shows on around in the Mid-South. And we were held in Arkansas one night playing at the Catholic Club. Bob Neal came in with Jerry Lee and J.W. Brown. And uh, first time we'd ever seen him there. He just got to Memphis. and that, uh, We had the band. and We had uh, Jack on the trumpet, Garn on the piano, and Russ Smith on the drum, J- uh, Joe Lewis on the guitar, myself on the guitar, and... Uh, Johnny Hubbard on bass. Mm. And guys like Warren Smith, uh, Eddie Bond, different people like that usually work those shows with us. So, but Jerry Lee was different than anybody else. I'll have to give him credit, boy. He, he came up with a sound that was, uh, which has been copied and recopied. Boy, everybody in the world play, wants to play like Jerry Lee now, but back then he was the only one. You know, we had piano players back then. You had uh, Merle Moore out of Texas. House of Blue Lights was a good boogie-woogie piano player. You had uh, Moon Mulligan, but they were more country. And then you had, uh, a little later on, you had the Piano Red out of New Orleans and different ones, piano player. But nobody liked Jerry Lee. And... He was something else. He's kind of like Elvis. He was one of a kind. Your um, your live performances back back in the day were quite unique too. You were very energetic on on stage and very visual. Um, tell us a bit about a, a typical show there. I believe you you would jump into the audience and you had a human pyramids going and, and all types of things. Well, we had uh, yeah, we liked uh, we were all young then, full of piss and vinegar, <laughs> and. Uh, of course, we'd do anything to get the crowd going, and uh, we would. Uh, Joe Lewis and I had 50-foot cords made. Didn't have wireless in that we knew of or could afford, so we could get out in the audience. And, uh, of course, Jack could come out there with us on the trumpet, and John Ray on the bass. It wasn't amplified either. So that'd leave Russ and Kern on stage keeping the music going, and we'd jump off the stage and get out in the crowd. Then we had a little... Uh, 
deal we picked up in 55 off of Roy Robinson when he came over here to Newport. And uh, he and his band, he had uh, Big Jack and Little Willie, I believe, was the bass player and the uh, rhythm guitar player with him that they did the bug dance. <laughs> so I saw him when they came to Newport. I saw him. I said, man, that'd be good. That's a good show. They'd pick up a bug off of the floor, throw it on one of them, and he'd start trying to catch that bug, and finally he'd catch it and throw it on the other. And I said, I said, we've got four guys. We can really. So that really turned out well for us. We really had to thank Orbison for that. I don't know where it came from, nothing else. But that uh, we amplified it, and we did real good. With We did have a wild show. It was like watching a three-ring circus. You couldn't watch one person. You had to watch the whole stage, what was going on. I believe you used to even uh, dye your hair to, to match up with your uh, stage costume at times. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that lasted about a month. Until <laughs> it, uh, me and my wife, Joanne, decided we'd, uh, I wanted to make my hair white. Of course, it is white now, but uh, I had a good head of hair back then, so we got us some dye at home and we dyed it but it turned red <laughs> orangey red <laughs> so it stayed that way for about a little over a month till it grew out hmm. um but you, it, you spent some time working with conway twitty as well how do you look back on that time there that was a good time we had a good a lot of fun with conway conway was Conway was a different guy, too. He was a super good country singer. He did rock and roll well, but not as near as good as he did country. And uh, But he, he had a good sound. He had a sound that he wanted. and So I played bass for him when, in 1960 until 61. He broke up the rock and roll band and was going to retire, and then he went and got into country. But it was fun. We had Joe Lewis and Jack Nance was with that band. They had gone with them in '57 when we when the Pacers broke up. Lack of money, play, stayed here and ran home too long. You know, you can't play forever in you know, Northeast Arkansas. You know, it's just not there. It's just not money wise. Yeah. Russ Smith went with Jerry Lee, and me and Kern John Ray. Then Bobby Crawford came along, 57, playing drums for us. So that was, uh, when my hair was red, that's when Crawford was with us when we went to California. Me and Bobby and uh, John Ray and J.C. Cothran, guitar player, Mother Alicia, Arkansas. He was real good. And uh, But Conway was somebody different. Boy, he... Uh, Oh, he'd do that only make believe, and had them little gals hanging on the front of the stage, crying. He said, "I think I'm on to something." <laughs> <laughs> I've read where Sam Phillips has been quoted as saying that uh, he felt you could have been one of the all-time greats, but you just never got the the breaks that you deserved. Can you put that down to any particular reason, or, or just bad luck? Ah, oh, who knows that. Uh, I think Sam tried. Sam didn't. It, uh, it's like uh, Billy Lee. Billy Lee th always thought Sam shafted him. Kept him being a star. But I told him one time, I said, you know, if if you were Sam Phillips and you had Jer you and Jerry Lee Lewis, two records hot, I said, which one would you uh, push? Mm. I said, you'd push Jerry Lee because... Riley was just like the rest of us. He was just the way the rest of us was. I think it's just uh, a combination. He couldn't, we didn't get the right songs. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, it just didn't happen, and it wasn't supposed to happen. Like I told him, I said, I think uh, it would have been, it would have been meant to men stars. We would have been stars. Then we could have been dead like the rest of them. Hmm. It certainly doesn't sound like you have any regrets anyway. No regrets. Well, why would I regret? 
thanks to Sun Records, I'm talking to you <laughs> <laughs> all the way in Australia. Yeah, that's true. I loved Australia. We came over there once and played. I really liked it. It was fun. Oh, we'd love to see Great you. Great people over there. We would love to see you back here. It'd be fantastic. Boy, I would love to come back before I get too old. <laughs> I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> <laughs> You spent a period of time away from music in the 70s and into the 80s. What, what was keeping you busy during that time? In the 70s, uh, I retired in 70. Well, in 72, I went to work, um, formed the Pace of the Kings Four in 60, well, 62, 61 to 62 after I left 20. Came back home and laid on. I know you've heard of Larry Don Gillahan mm -hmm. out of Bono. Larry Don was a Jerry Lee Lewis copy. Played the piano like Jerry Lee. Good, great voice, good singer. And we played together for two years. Then I formed a band called the Kings Four, which guys around home here. Tommy Timms on the drums, Bobby Nelson on the organ, the, uh, the stack sound that hit us in. So we had the organ, we had Gene Grant on saxophone, we had Kern playing some piano, Tim Vaughn and Doug Greeno playing bass, myself on guitar. And we had a really good show band, not kind of like the original Pacers. We were really good, good show band because it had so many things going on. I did that up till uh, 72 when I got offered a job by a company out of St. Louis. St. Louis trimming, and they want me to travel parts of three states, which was Arkansas, Tennessee, and Missouri. And they were from St. Louis, Missouri. So I thought, okay, I tried it there for a little while, and then my boss called from St. Louis and said, I want to expand your territory to eight states, making me a traveling salesman. So music. Wasn't really going anywhere at the end. There's too much around here at home, you know, just you can't, you don't play the club so long and then you just simply get tired of it, you wear out, whatever, it doesn't matter. So I said, yeah, I'll give it a club. Then I got out of the music business till up to 84, I guess. Well, I'll take it back. I did go to Memphis because um, Stan Kester was working for Sam Phillips at the time, he and Roland James. Of course, Paul Burleson was hanging out over there with them and old guys like us. They'd call once a year when Memphis and May, I forget what it's called back then, say, come on over, we're going to play. Mm -hmm. So we'd go over and we'd have a big time playing. And then that's about it. In 84, 86, I guess it was, old uh, J.R. came up from Nashville. Uh, Hall of Fame, Music Hall of Fame there in Nashville, Country Music Hall of Fame. They were having a deal in uh, Washington, D.C. on the mall there in Washington, D.C. and uh, between the Lincoln Center and the big tall building on the lawn. Anyway, every year they do that or every so often. Smithsonian buildings there and everything else. But to make the story short, they were having the Tennessee and Japan was a country and a state. So Jay said, well, then you, you need to put the rockabilly music in there. I said, well, okay, you put together a rockabilly band. So he came to Memphis. <laughs> mm -hmm. He got Stan and Roland, Paul Burleson, myself, uh, J.M. Van Eaton was playing drums for us, and uh, Smoochie Smith. Smoochie had the Million Seller record uh, last night. Nice. Oh, and uh, anyway, we had an all-star band. Stan Custer was playing bass for us. And, but Roland said he didn't want to go. So we picked up Marcus Van Story. Marcus used to play with uh, Warren Smith. He's a great showman. People, uh, he was 80, 
that time, he was 82 years old, I guess it was, something like that, seven, almost 80. And uh, oh, he'd jump off that stage and clown around that bass and played a little harmonica. So anyway, we went up there, the Smithsonian, and all of a sudden the world discovered us again. Hmm. We became famous. We were getting, we went everywhere. I'm telling what people booked us all over the world. Didn't make it to Australia, but that's Australia's loss now. <laughs> that's true. We had, we had a really good show group. But anyway, J.M. Van Eaton's uh, boss, he sells bonds there in Memphis. His boss said, you want to play music or sell bonds? <laughs> J.M. thought about it. He said, no, nah, I better keep selling the bonds. <laughs> <laughs> so we called Stan and said, I know Stan, uh, D.J. Fontana, Elvis drummer. He's in Nashville. said, he'll play with us. Sure enough, he did, and we stayed together for about 10 years till everybody started dying off, and this was uh, 86 to about 96, and we recorded some albums. We did the Chicago Blues Festival, went to Europe, and we're going to Japan, and uh, Japan fell into hard times at one time. That fell through, so anyway, we broke up. And I said, well, that sounds like a pretty good group. They did their pretty good run. I said, I wonder if the old Pacers could get back together and do that. So anyway, we'd done a little, a few things together. Kern was still playing. John Ray. Well, John Ray had retired. So I put together a group and got a hold of a, Jim Aldridge, who plays saxophone for us now, got a hold of Jim Kern, uh, Bobby Crawford, myself, and Doug Greeno. And J.C. Cawthorn played some with us, too, then. And so we got do, we got doing pretty good. Mm. And a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Anyway, we're uh, we're still playing now. And that was 96. You got, Not as hot as we were then, but we're still doing pretty good. Still going Thanks strong. Thanks to Sam Phillips and Sun Records. You've had uh, quite a quite a following across Europe. But do, do you have a theory on uh, why the, the Europeans are so strong on this type of music? It's very an American form of music, but it's got such an appeal to the Europeans. You know, I don't know that. You, you're right. Nobody bought that question. I don't know. That's strange, but the biggest fans in the world, of course, Australia's got a lot of good fans, too. Japan has a ton of them. And then, but then you go to Europe, and then the States, you know, it's so-so. It's not uh, not like it is in Europe. I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, they got to us later is what happened. They, they wasn't much Sun Records up here in Europe until the 60s, mm -hmm. after after it was pretty well gone. You know, it, it moved on to the next phase. And, uh, but they have, thank goodness, they've really been good. So, and they're still coming out. We just got back from Sweden, did a cruise over there, and, you know, it, it was really good. So, Going back uh, to England in the spring. Do, oh, doing a deal in uh, California on the Queen Mary, I believe it is. They got sitting out there in Los Angeles. It's not a ship that sails anymore, but they have a big rockabilly party on it. <laughs> and uh, they're doing one in Nashville. Same guy doing one in Los Angeles and doing one in Nashville. At the Grand Ole Opry, of all places. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I'd like to know what the next music coming is. It's it's strange. It's uh, how music has changed, and country has become soft rock. It's not country no more. No, that's true. And uh, rockabilly is not anybody hardly doing rockabilly. You know, uh, the Straight Cats came along and revived it there once, out of Europe. 
Mm-hmm. The Beatles revived it again in the 60s. And um, since then, nobody's really come along and revived it. <laughs> I don't guess they will. Some young dude. I don't know. There's, there's some pretty good Elvis uh, tribute artists now, they call them, instead of imitators. Some of them are pretty good. We got one here in Arkansas called Cody Slaughter, who's really good. I don't know whether he's been to Australia yet or not, but uh, he's one of the best. He looks a lot like Elvis, a little taller than Elvis was, but uh, good-looking young guy, 20, 21, something like that, and sings good. And uh, and there's some more like Brandon uh, Bennett and different ones like that. We get we still do the Elvis Festival in Tupelo, Mississippi every year, and uh, we're booked already again this year for it. They bring in these tribute artists plus other country music, a lot of other artists, different people playing. That's a really good time. We go there, and Charlie Watson used to be here at Newport, had the Silver Moon Club run it for a while for Don Washington. That was our base, I guess you'd call it, where we kind of called our home base. And he built him a little deal there, and, and Tupelo he called the Silver Moon Club. It's really something. If you ever get to Tupelo, Mississippi, look him up. Oh. You'll see some stuff you've never seen. He's got more pictures and Elvis memorabilia than you've ever seen. Now, um, tell us about the, the current lineup of the, of the Legendary Pacers. Uh, tell us about the guys in the band. The band now? Yeah. Okay, the band we got now is uh, what we call them. The, I named them the Legendary Pacers. You remember uh, when I first started going to Europe, went to Charlie Records. They were, you remember them? Yes, yes I do. They did some fantastic. They were in England at that time, and Willie Jeffrey, who I work still work for, some in England, really went over there with him. We went down to Charlie, and they gave me all kinds of records. They not only did rock and did everything else. But anyway, they put out these albums, vinyl, which is coming back, <laughs> hmm. called. Uh, the legendary Sun performers, and one on me, Riley, Warren Smith, Carl Perkins, Jerry Lee, uh, who else? Uh, oh, fiddle, Carl Mann. They gave me a bunch of those things, and, and I've uh, donated the ones I had to the Arkansas State University, who's uh, redoing the... Uh, Johnny Cash home and all over Dias, Arkansas. They're starting a rockabilly museum there in Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. And I donated those things to them. Anyway, I decided we'd call the pay. I started out, I thought, well, Worldwide Pacers, you know, some kind of little different name or something. Then I looked that out and I said, Legendary, that sounds better. <laughs> so now we're Sonny Birds and Legendary Pacers. We got Bobby Crawford still playing drums. <laughs> we got Fred Douglas, who used to be with Teddy Riddell. You remember Teddy Riddell had Judy, Pipeliner yes. Blues, and so he was a piano player. Yep. He played guitar for him. Anyway, Teddy's playing, uh, Fred's playing bass for him, Jim Aldridge, saxophone, harmonica. And um, Kern Kennedy's still playing piano. And... Uh, I guess that's it, just the five of us. J.C. played with us for a while, but he got in bad health and finally uh, got killed in a car wreck. So once in a while, we'll pick up a guitar player that here at home that's uh, really good, Mike Dickerson, if we can afford him. I'll take him along because he's uh, super good. Hmm. I don't play near half as good as I used to. I never did play great anyway start with, but now I don't play near near that good because I'm getting arthritis. I'm kind of like Scotty Moore. I'm getting arthritis. Mm. That's why Scotty quit playing with arthritis of the thumb. Now, I believe you've got your own radio show happening over there as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Okay. That's with 
KASU 91.9 FM on the radio dial. You can, Jonesboro, Arkansas, that's part of Arkansas State University. Ah, yes. And uh, I do a two-hour radio show on Sundays, 5 to 7, and it's called We Want a Boogie, and you can pick it up on the Internet at wewantaboogie.org. Okay. Wewantaboogie.org, O-R-G. You can actually pick it up. Terrific. We'll uh, listen to it online. Okay, well, good. Fantastic. And um, we'll, I'll say something about you on it. I go, in fact, I go over Thursday and record. Wow. We do. Uh, I got June Taylor, lady that works there for ASU. She's the computer expert. She and uh, we co-host the thing, and we're going on 500 shows now. Let's see. Yep, we're closing in on 500. Wow. So that's uh, just something to do. Tremendous. <laughs> I'll be sure to give, I'll be sure to give you a listen. If, just before I let you go, Sonny, uh, just one last question. Do what? Just one last question before I let you go. I, okay, I keep sneezing. I don't know why I'm sneezing. That's okay. Cold, I guess. <laughs> one last question. Okay. If you had any any advice for for a young musician just starting out, what would be the main piece of advice you'd want to give them? Try and work up something different. Kind of like Sam told us, come back with. Come back with something a little different than what everybody else is bringing. You know, uh, Harold Jenkins, Conway Twitty, he went to Sun and cut some demos. But like uh, Sam told him, he said, now I've already got some hiccuppers. Mm -hmm. The the Barnett brothers went over there and recorded. Uh, My old buddy, uh, Narva Felch. Went over there and recorded. Never got it. They got released later on when they came out of those out- outtakes. But uh, a lot of people, everybody wanted to be on Sun Records, I guess. And thank goodness for Sun Records. Like I said, I wouldn't still be playing. Yeah. Or trying to play. But little, except for guys like you, call every once in a while. And we appreciate all you've done to help us. Um, we'll keep doing it too. Sonny, thank you so much for your time. It's been a, an absolute honour speaking to you, someone that was right there at the, the beginning All right, well, of Rock and Roll. thank you for calling and, and uh, out back. I'd like to be over there where it's good and warm. <laughs> well, it's not too warm here today, <laughs> but it usually is. And uh, we hope we get to see you back in Australia one more time. That would be fantastic. I hope so. That would be fantastic. You're right. Thanks a lot. Take care of yourself. Thank you too. All the best. Bye. Bye-bye.